So uh, I want to start by uh, saying hello, my fellow unicorns. It's um, great to be uh, working with you. This is going to be a conversation um, that centers on a little bit uh, more the why than the how. There will be some how involved, and there's lots of how next week, but uh, often, in my experience, especially doing method stuff, um, we get excited by tools, right? We're like, oh, this AI thing, or how do you get this, or how do you, and often uh, we don't have the time to take that step back and say, why, 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 why do I want to do this? Why do I want to buy this? Why do I want to go down this road? Uh, what could be the knock-on effects of doing that? So uh, this is going to be a talk where we kind of bounce some of those ideas around. I hope you are um, pleased with my um, don't be a jerk unicorn that I found on the internet. Okay, so uh, you can see I've got a bit of an agenda here. As usual, I'm going to go through it New York style fast, but the slides are available for you to look at. They are on Slido. So if you go over there, you can pull them down and follow along uh, with me. So we're going to start by talking about three ways to sort of conceptualize this why of ethics. Then we're going to move into the, uh, the kind of chronology of how you might work through ethics. Lots of us think about ethics when we're trying to get uh, approval from somebody, clearance. But um, that is only one way to think about it. And frankly, it's the, it's the most boring way. And it's also the, the, the least innovative way in terms of moving stuff forward. So we're going to talk about clearance. We'll talk about field work. We'll talk about something called rolling out. Uh, we'll talk about write-up, review, and publicity. I will be dropping some terminology while we go through that. I'm going to cue you now that we, I promise I got you, we will get into that terminology. And you can see here, ethics, here's some terms that we're going to sort of cover. The concept of informed consent, the concept of harm and risk, anonymity versus confidentiality. We're going to talk about the assumption of privacy online. We're going to be, which is a, a fancy way of that uh, question we all have, can I, I found this online, can I quote it, can I use it, can I look at it? Then we're gonna talk a little bit about data protection. It is its own universe, but we'll signal to it. We're going to talk a fair amount about vulnerable populations because many of us um, work with them. And uh, I feel really honored to be working with people in our unicorn groups who are coming from areas that have conflict, areas that have a big youth populations, areas that really struggle with issues like poverty. These are where vulnerable populations come from and they are served in different ways by ethics than if you did a survey of 200 Midwestern American university students. Uh, we're going to be talking, um, actually, I took harm reduction off the list because that is, um, that term has so much medical resonance about the drug community that I've decided instead that we will talk about ethics of care. Sorry about that. Um, and then we'll talk about engagement. Uh, our next speaker after me is uh, talking about inclusion. So uh, I won't be spending a lot of time on that, but that's where we're going. That's our roadmap. Okay, so we start with this notion of ethics three ways. So if you sort of thought about ethics in this, you know, if you were up in a, you know, a satellite looking down at the earth of ethics, you might see it in terms of these interlocking diamonds. You've got a notion of protecting, you've got a notion of care, and you've got a notion of respect. These are slightly different terms. Usually when we're working uh, for clearance, we're working on the protect part, that dark purple part. Protection tends to involve things like getting government approval or getting institutional approval. Um, IRB, Institutional Review Board, people call it different things in their own uh, countries. Um, 
talking about legal conduct, right? So you, if you are doing something, you can't be engaging in criminal behavior. If you're studying people who sell drugs, you're not supposed to be buying drugs, for instance, if, if drug purchase is illegal. Um, ideas about ethical conduct. There are certain sorts of behaviors in our organization that we're not supposed to engage in if we're on the ground working with people. Uh, and then we move from kind of that protection, that sort of legal idea of ethics, more into a care idea when we start to talk about uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, many countries and jurisdictions have specific rules about those. Uh, and so that's why they're sort of between protection and care. Now, uh, if we move to this sort of care, this pink uh, uh, diamond, we see uh, notions uh, like consent. So that you would want consent to be informed and not coerced out of somebody. You've got ideas about personal privacy and confidentiality. Um, these involve notions of anonymity or pseudonymity or face blurring if you wanna talk about technologies and we'll get all of that down um, in a little bit. So don't panic on that. Uh, then the idea of uh, data protection because people's data is at this point as, um, as valuable and as um, traceable as their name would be, right? Geolocation can sometimes be more dangerous than my uh, official name on a birth certificate. Then we have um, ideas about care and aid, and that can be uh, physical or emotional. And then we've got um, harm reduction and risk management, uh, which has to do with um, physical, emotional, personal, organizational, et cetera. So now that we've got these kind of two diamonds, we're going to move into our final uh, diamond. And uh, for lots of folks, this comes under the um, umbrella of sort of um, uh, engagement and inclusion, but it's quite useful to be thinking about this stuff right up top, uh, asking yourself, what population am I interested in engaging with and why? And when you get to the why, you will start to come up with these questions around respecting things like identifications, personal and group, or beliefs and values, or power dynamics, or ideas about reflecting and returning to your own ideas, bringing your stuff back to uh, participants in your communities, and um, you'll, you may even be talking about things like uh, reward and recognition. I often, I, I have done a little bit of work in uh, the sex work uh, community uh, and have colleagues who do that work. And it's, they often say that sex workers are constantly approached by researchers who just think that they've got all the time in the world to give them data for a study when they never offer to, I don't know, pay them for their time since that's what they charge for as sex workers. So uh, now that we've got uh, these three diamonds in this sort of meta level, let's look at how it sort of all comes together, okay? You can look at this uh, at your leisure on the slides. I'm gonna move on to a day in the life of a research team. So we can think about six phases here with ethics. We can think about a clearance phase, a field work phase, a rollout phase, a write up phase, a review phase, and a publicity phase. And we're gonna go through each one of them right now. So we're gonna start with the clearance phase. So in the clearance phase, you're doing things like you're formulating your methods, you're drafting your materials, you're securing your uh, uh, permission from authorities to do your work, to do your thing. You're not gonna start on a project without clearing it. So what at the ethical level might that um, involve? Well, I apologize for all of the uh, text on the screen, but I did tell you, you can download the slides. Uh, I'm gonna go through these steps quickly. And of course, we're going to circle back to many of them as we 
uh, dig deeper into the terminology. But the first question you're going to want to ask yourself is, does your organization have an internal review board? If so, get their guidelines for approving projects. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Then you're going to be asking yourself, are you engaging with a particular national population? If so, get that country's guidelines for approving research or activist projects. Uh, sometimes if you are crossing national lines, uh, to you need certain kinds of visas. There's Every government has its own set of guidelines. Then at number three, the question we have is, are you engaging with vulnerable or at-risk populations? If so, get the local guidelines for securing permissions to work with them. So uh, a question you might have now is, how do I know if I'm working with those populations? And we will get to that, I promise, when we get to the terminology. Then four, uh, a question is, are you covering topics that are related to or possibly eliciting psychological or emotional trauma? If so, obtain training in mental health first aid. So uh, sometimes it's hard to make a leap to what might cause trauma. Uh, in when we're talking about health and health information, it's not that hard to imagine a scenario, especially if you're talking about misinformation, where somebody was traumatized as a result of receiving health misinformation. It's also not hard to imagine a scenario in which somebody is disclosing to you that they've become involved in um, conspiracies or rumors or stigma circulation that has put them in proximity to extremist groups and they may find uh, that upsetting or um, uh, causing them uh, a lot of consternation. There is training to handle this kind of uh, stuff and I've got a link later on to the um, mental health first aid training. Uh, it's actually excellent. Number five, do you plan on surveying or polling participants online? If so, to get something cleared, you're gonna to have to describe how you're gonna do it, provide sample questions. You're going to have to draft up a project explanation for the participants and plans to ensure uh, anonymity if, if you're doing sort of uh, online anonymous type uh, work. If you're doing interviews, then you would deal with that in a different way through pseudonyms, which we will talk about. Then number six, will you be watching or interviewing or talking with participants online or offline? If so, explain again your intended processes, your plans for recruiting participants, your measures for identity protection, your protocols for recording and storing collected data, and we will be talking about that shortly. And again, your sample questions. You then draft informed consent forms, as well as any recruiting material, and we will be drilling into informed consent shortly. So then you prepare all that stuff, number seven, and then you submit it to uh, approval with your organizational folks, with your national people, maybe with some partners that you're working on. And um, that is the general uh, process for getting clearance. Most people stop conversations with ethics right here. We're gonna move on. We're moving on to field work. So, Field work means you're out doing your thing, right? It's uh, here you want to be complying with guidelines and best practices relevant to engagement, inclusion, risk management, and harm reduction. So uh, here you're going to be asking yourself questions like, does your workplace have a formal code of conduct for interacting with the public? If so, that's your bare minimum that you're going to follow, right? Number two, do any professional organizations in your field provide conduct guidelines? If so, consider these in your public engagement protocols. So if you're in news organizations, journalists have these things. If you are an internet researcher, internet research uh, organizations have these things. Uh, it, it depends with whom you're affiliated, right? 
Uh, number three, are there any NGOs with a mission that overlaps with your project focus? So I'm doing a lot of work around young people and um, the go-to folks for that are UNICEF. And I spent a fair amount of time looking through their materials because uh, they give me ways of thinking about my work I'm not going to get just having a conversation with three other people who talk about just the internet. Number four, are you covering topics that are related to or possibly eliciting psychological or emotional trauma? We're back to this again. If so, start your scenario planning. So this is something that a lot of people forget. They maybe do a training and then they never think what situations they might wind up in. And there are plenty of resources for doing these as, as you know, making your own Elmore. Uh, but a lot of what people forget is to carve the time to do that. You don't want to be figuring it out as it happens. Number five, are you engaging people living in conditions of danger or risk? And we'll drill down on that in a moment. If so, commit to an ethic of care. By this, I mean you balance a responsibility to amplify somebody's voice with a co-responsibility for any social, political, or economic fallout resulting from amplification. You don't ask people to put themselves out there and then step away right as the world is coming back at them for what they've said or the stand they've taken. And very often, this isn't because we're bad, it's because we've not thought it through. We'll talk a little bit more about that with regard to data in a moment. Number six, if you encounter somebody in danger, risk, or re-traumatized as a result of your interactions, do you have a plan for managing that? If not, again, scenario plan it. Number seven, if you find yourself targeted by local authorities or rival populations or organized online extremist movements, it happens. Uh, do you have a plan for managing this? If not, it's time to scenario plan, okay? If you get into the space of conspiracy theories, you need to know that you're gonna wind up in the space, at least tangentially, of extremism. And online extremist movements are highly organized and they understand how to weaponize public perception and algorithmic movement of outrage. You need to know that and be prepared. So now we're gonna move to rollout. So uh, here you start with a question. Are you gonna be introducing an activity or a process or an application to a group, right? Is it an app or a, or, or a training or something? If so, you've got a rollout phase. Number two, have you requested and received direct feedback from the population you're working with about its desires and needs? If not, collect that prior to development and rollout. I cannot tell you how many tech projects people pitch, and I'm sure you know better than I do, uh, where you say, have you ever even spoken to this population? And they say, well, no, but I think that, you know, it would be really good to, the last one I saw was shoes for sex walkers that would geolocate them to, so people could help them with their, you know, uh, needs. And we were like, but also surveillance, what are you doing? So talking with your population first, then small scale testing, that would be three, okay? to ensure that you're meeting people where they're at. We can have very sexy rollouts, particularly for um, interfaces that seem like they have a lot of bells and whistles and are very exciting, but people struggle to use. We see that in our own infodemic training, right? Uh, number four, do you plan on recording or tracking engagement with this activity you're rolling out or this process or this site or this app? If so, Make sure users are aware and gain consent 
for uh, regarding national data collection guidelines. And we'll go through those shortly. Number five, does your activity or site or app involve some, uh, allow for community or social surveillance of some sort? So does using something, you've built a bunch of, you know, thumbs up and forwarding and metrics into the dashboard so everybody can see what everybody else is doing. Are there any social knock-on effects of that that you need to kind of be aware of? Are there any kind of institutional knock-ons that you might need to be aware of? Are there police who are sitting there monitoring that dashboard? Number six, if someone finds themselves in danger at risk or re-traumatized as a result of your rollout, do you have a plan for managing this? If not, you know my favorite phrase, start scenario planning. And then number seven, might you yourself be targeted by local authorities or rival populations or organized online extremist movements as a result of this uh, rollout? Could be your organization. Somebody could decide to launch a denial of service attack. Uh, if so, begin scenario planning. You don't need to know all the answers, but you need to know what might be coming down the pipe because then you can start looking for best practices and putting out feelers for, for help. So now we're in this write-up phase, okay? Here we're complying with best practices regarding acknowledgement and anonymity, pseudonymity, de-identification practices like blurring images, et cetera. So first things first, are there communities or groups or individuals who should be explicitly acknowledged for their contributions to this project? Do this and link to their work. People, a shout out goes a long way. It is, you know, social capital is the, uh, is, is the least costly capital and, um, and the uh, less frequently used. Number two, are there individuals or groups or workplaces um, who should be described in this write-up using pseudonyms? And we'll get to that shortly. Number three, are there images or sounds that could be used to identify a pseudonymous source or an individual who is not given consent? For instance, somebody who's an extra in a photo online. If so, use blurring tools and we'll get to those. Number four, are there quotations to online material from uh, sources that could easily be traced? If so, paraphrase. So much research can be paraphrased especially when you're talking about um, social science oriented research like sentiment uh, analysis and behavioral uh, stuff. It, the, the demands from journals, for instance, in sociology uh, for exact name to exact quote are different when, uh, when you're talking about populations at, at, who could be at risk. Number five, might this write up put any individuals or organizations at risk? If so, consider alternate narration methods like composite characterizations and scenario fabrication to describe dynamics without endangering subjects. Again, if you're in the hard sciences, this might be very new to you. And uh, that's something that I'm happy to talk with people uh, about tools for doing that in, in a way that um, is ethical. Sometimes it's more ethical to derive a composite than to name an individual directly and cause harm to them. Number six, might this write-up re-traumatize someone? If so, you share your preliminary write-up with a note that shares your commitments to principles of harm reduction or care, um, providing the option to withdraw consent, right? All participants have the option even at the write-up phase to say, I, no, I don't wanna be part of this. Might this write-up put your, your organization at risk? We've had this question again, again, scenario planning. Now, once you've written up something, it goes to review. It doesn't go right out for publicity, okay? So again, you've got these questions. Are there individuals or communities or organizations who should see this write-up? Contact them. 
Are there organizations or individuals who can provide informal peer review? Con consider contacting them. Are there individuals or groups or organizations who should not be looking at this material? If so, begin developing contingency plans should they do so. So this is where uh, we want to consult best practices from, for instance, activist and news organizations. They spend a fair amount of time figuring out how to protect information from, uh, from eyes that shouldn't be looking at it yet until it's made public. Is this write-up number four part of an ongoing or iterative process? So are there multiple phases of this going on? develop protocols for a whole piece assessment. Number five, might this write-up put anybody at risk for negative social surveillance? Again, if so, you share your preliminary write-up with a commit with a note that says, you know, you can withdraw. Number six, might this cause problems if it's released to the public prior to review? Uh, this happens with a number of people who do internet research. They'll do uh, some preliminary work or they'll even put like a closed blog post sort of talking through their ideas. And the next thing they know, they appear, their name appears in the press as though they've done like a whole full peer reviewed study and a million people are calling them. Um, and then again, would, could this write up put your, you or your organization at risk? We're on the final step, which is publicity. So here we have the questions. One, does your workplace have designated spots online for sharing stuff um, or PR people? If so, contact them. Have you worked with organizations who might want this work showcased on their sites? Then you contact those. Number three, do you know where individuals and groups included in this work get their information offline? Publicize them. So, you know, not everybody is reading, you know, our health journals. So getting stuff out to communities in ways that they are comfortable with, I feel like you know, I'm speaking to the choir here and you know this, but it's worth underscoring. And again, putting it in local languages. Number five, are you familiar with the online platforms and channels where the people included in this work receive their information? Do you understand the interaction styles they prefer? And then number six would be, are you familiar with how much information feels like too much information, right? Part of the infodemic. It happens with us too, uh, for different stakeholders. So policy makers, health providers, activists, young people, they take in information in different ways. And frankly, policy makers, can take in less information sometimes than young people. Uh, figure out how you want to break material into chunks with links to the whole, uh, the whole project for people who want to dig deeper. And then are you gauging response to the uh, publicly circulating material using the social listening tools we've been talking about? Because you might discover groups who are inadvertently left out or people who are actually now at risk for your work or new developments that need attention. So that was a quick and dirty um, pass through the chronology of sort of an ethical way of working. Now we're gonna dig into some terms. So I had some fun making some icons here and you can see we're gonna be going through notions of informed consent, harm and risk, and the anonymity and confidentiality, the assumption of privacy, which is different than the legal expectation of privacy, uh, data protection, the notion of vulnerable populations, young people who are their kind of own thing, the concept of ethics of care, the notion of engagement, and then we'll be handing it off for inclusion. So let's talk about informed consent. So informed consent has the following elements. Your participants need to know the purpose of what you're doing. They need to know the procedures that are gonna go on. They need to understand the risks and benefits of participating. They need to understand how long it's gonna take. They need to 
be assured that there will be uh, confidentiality maintained regarding their personal identification. They need confidentiality regarding the, um, uh, their demographic data. That's often uh, called data protection. And they need assurance that their participation is entirely voluntary. So that, those are the elements of uh, informed consent. I have a document that um, there's links where this stuff is, is living. And you are more than welcome to look at them at your leisure. But um, uh, for folks who like to have some paperwork, I've included some material here that's annotated. That is your standard consent form. To get somebody's informed consent, you need to uh, yourself have a sense of the harm and risk associated with the project. And you need to communicate that to your uh, to anybody you're working with. So what is the difference between harm and risk? The difference is, frankly, the present and the future, right? Harm, it's happening now. Risk, it's something that, that we're trying to weigh a probability. It's a probability of harm or possibility of harm. So there are the Belmont report, which is kind of the gold standard for this, risks four kinds of risks. We've got physical, psychological, social, which could have to do with stigmatization, and economic. Those are the sort of classic risks, okay? So uh, we will do a little more in risk in a moment, but for now, um, we'll talk about a uh, classic kind of risk, which would be the risk of um, identity disclosure. So the way we talk about that is through a conversation about anonymity, versus confidentiality, they are different things. So anonymity is a situation where the subjects aren't known by researchers. So if you're doing like an anonymous survey online. Confidentiality is when you know uh, the person's identity, but you take steps to protect that identity from being discovered by others. No. How do you do that? Well, there's uh, no. four major ways. You could uh, change their name to a pseudonym. You can use what we call visual concealment of images. You can do what we call metadata scrubbing of the material that, uh, that sort of uh, is embedded within images. And you could do at the writing level uh, uh, narrative compositing. So the basic strategy of providing pseudonyms is you take the participant's name out and then you put a make-believe name in, right? There are some advanced strategies like you might be removing a job title or a gender or a geography or a membership in a club, or you might change an organization's name. Uh, everything is driven by that why question because um, uh, when you, are making something, uh, when you're swapping names, it's always to protect, right? And you only promise the level of anonymity that you can realistically provide, right? Um, and that is, uh, that's a sort of standard legal way of understanding uh, this because nobody can, especially when we're talking about internet stuff, nobody can, fully protect anybody. But there are some strategies, especially when we're talking about images. So uh, this is an organization I'm gonna talk about in a little bit uh, called witness.org. If you don't know their work, I recommend it highly. Witness and Amnesty are kind of my go-tos when I'm thinking about protection. Uh, these are some ideas about concealing identity while filming somebody. You film their hands, you cover their face, you blur the focus of the camera. While you're editing, you can pixelate or you can blur, right? Uh, you also wanna be taking metadata off of images. And that is the material that is um, in images that gives us questions like who took this or where was it taken or when was it taken or what was the name of this? Uh, I think we've all sort of heard stories in the news of people. Uh, I remember when, um, 
President Trump had this happen to him, uh, saying he was sending out, you know, in the moment photos. And then when people looked at the, the timestamps on them in the metadata, they were like, these were all staged. So uh, there are tools that uh, you can use to scrub metadata. The next uh, issue I want to talk with folks about is what I call assumption of privacy. This is a term that is different from what in American law would be called expectation of privacy. There are kind of legal standards for that. Assumption of privacy is more a social construct, and it is uh, a way that we've developed to think about the fact that even if everything is freely available online, not everybody experiences the their, themselves as being in a public forum. So I made a handy infographic. It's long, so I had to split it in two. Um, and you are more than welcome to uh, download this and look at it at your leisure, and we can talk about it all you wish. But the main distinctions that you want to be asking yourself are, are we dealing with somebody who's considered a public person, or are we dealing with somebody who's a non-public person? And if we are dealing with a public person, are they appearing in a public space, like an official site? Uh, if they are, are they speaking officially or unofficially? Or is that official person appearing in a non-public space, like work comments, in a, it, it, making uh, comments in a neighborhood community online? right? You can see that there are different distinctions for whether that is considered um, uh, a public utterance or yes, even public officials get to have the, the expectation uh, or the at least perception of privacy. This gets on the don't be a jerk side of ethics, because uh, you will see many times I've written my answer to whether you can uh, publish something is yes or yes, but. And the reason is because uh, there are many areas of uh, working in online communities that are still a little bit of a, a wild west in terms of rules. Uh, a big one, and I put it at the very bottom, under bear in mind on the right hand side are um, communities that are uh, using technology that are time based. So um, uh, some Instagram stories I think are like this, Snapchat is always like this, where the intention is, even if it's public utterance, the, the intention is that it's supposed to be ephemeral in the moment that it's supposed to disappear. So if you take that and you act like it was something that was set in stone for all time, you're actually, you're putting a, a very personal read on that event that, that especially if you're dealing with kids, that may or may not have been their intention or perception. So these are things to think about. I'd love to say, here is the right answer, here is the wrong answer. That's called morals, you know, thou shalt not do this. Ethics are always situational and contextual. And they always begin with the question, why? Why do you want to say this? Why do you want to know this? Why do you want to publicize this? And then from that why, we figure out how to proceed. So uh, this is a very quick tour down the road of uh, data protection. So there are three ways mainly to think about data protection. You can think about how things are collected, you can think about how things are stored, and you can think about how things get shared. Uh, we probably all know about things like communicating using VPN uh, and storing you know, things uh, securely in the cloud and uh, communicating over channels that have the encryption. This could be its own topic and um, I'm not really your girl for that. So we're gonna move past that, but I'm happy to talk with people who wanna find some advice on that. 
Uh, I do want to emphasize uh, the work of this fantastic uh, internet researcher named Katie Pierce. She works with a lot of uh, communities in areas of war, and uh, she's written this fantastic piece that I have uploaded for you called Unintended Consequences of Using Digital Methods in Difficult Research Environments. And in that, she talks a little bit about what are called um, digital trace data. And uh, one type of digital trace data is what we've been calling social listening, right? You kind of search everything online for different words and patterns and whatnot. And what she mentions is a lot of that material, we pull it down, but it's rarely anonymized, right? So you have people's information. And she says, well, analyses of trace data can make visible patterns of association. That's what we're trying to figure out, sentiments, movements, virality. Illuminating these associations, that is to say the networks between people, can add additional risks for individuals. Especially in difficult environments, research about networks has implications for individuals. If the police are monitoring, and they are, um, social media traffic, and they realize that you are the node that all of these other things come from, that can be grounds for, um, for, for prosecuting you, for, for doing a lot of things. She also says, in the 21st century, any researcher is going to have to have a phone and a laptop, which need to be secured. We know this. But recommendations and IT department assistance about security in one's home country are likely insufficient, right? So just asking the IT guy is probably not what we want to do at this point. She says guides for activists and journalists are the most useful ways to familiarize yourself with the understanding that in a couple of months, these things may have to be freshened. So again, here are three that I like quite a bit, Amnesty International, witness.org, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation who do a lot of um, data work. Uh, I also liked some of these checklists, which I've included in a file for you from um, uh, AAS. Uh, and this one was, should I collect location-based data in this crisis situation? And it gives some uh, it gives some parameters for trying to make that decision. There's a whole worksheet that you can work through. They also have one that is about should I share this location-based data? And there are some things that you can work through. So uh, at the end of this talk, there's a link, and you, you, you're welcome to go check that out. There's also a very uh, nice um, uh, tool that UN Global Pulse developed that you can, it's sort of a, a, a risk assessment tool that you can run for your project before you even send it out for clearance. And it'll help you flag a lot of things that you might have to get answers to. And there's a lot of why-oriented questions in it, so I like it quite a bit. Um, this is just a piece of, you know, just a, a quick and dirty uh, example of language that you might use uh, if you're submitting something to approval. And now we're going to move on to uh, vulnerable populations because this is a very important group for us, as I've said. So there are some folks who uh, cannot give informed consent and um, they are vulnerable, they are considered vulnerable populations. So you can be a vulnerable population in one of two ways. You can either have difficulty providing consent that's voluntary and uh, informed, you could have a cognitive disability, right? You could have Alzheimer's or something, uh, or you could be living under coercive circumstances where um, you aren't free to make a choice. In perhaps a domestic violence situation would be that. Uh, a second group would be folks who are especially at risk for exploitation. So the uh, there's been a bit of a, a listing of those kind of folks, so we're going to look at those. So common rule of those folks are children, and children generally means under the age of 18. Uh, prisoners, pregnant women, fetuses, 
uh, mentally disabled persons, economically disadvantaged persons, and obviously th that's wide open to, to interpretation. And additionally, educationally disadvantaged persons as well. Uh, these, these guidelines uh, are generally spelt out at the country level. And it's important to, that's why I, I say, make sure you, you have national guidelines for things. We can also add, and Katie Pierce talks about this quite a bit, persons living in difficult environments. So for Pierce, she calls those places where daily life is unpredictable, uncertain, and permeated by fear. Here, normal existence is rampant with risk, regardless of choices individuals make to avoid it or mitigate it. So examples, conflict zones, politically repressive environments, authoritarian states or areas where quote terrorist groups are active. This is a very important um, distinction for particularly those of us working with young people who may be heading into radicalization. So um, even if you don't consider your cohort to be in, in this kind of difficulty, it's worth following the, the best case work on this. So I'm going to talk about young people here. Uh, obviously, young people are intersectional, which means that they can, you know, you can be uh, young and also living in a war zone and also have a developmental disability and also, right, you can have all of those things all at the same time. But young people are different from other kinds of populations in some ways because they're time bound. We assume young people turn into adults. So uh, I've got this bit and um, I don't want you to get overwhelmed by all the writing. Uh, I share it, this is an Australian definition. Um, uh, I share it because the idea of informed consent for young people, especially when you're researching their attitudes, um, turns very much on their capacity to uh, understand what's going on. And uh, you can see here under A, he or she is mature enough to understand the relevant information and give consent, okay? B, the re research involves no more than low risk. Uh, there's also a, a, a section that I wanted to share with you that's uh, number two at the bottom. Uh, if it would be contrary to the best interests of the young person to, to seek consent from the parents and the provision is made to protect the person's safety, security, and well-being. I share this because I have colleagues who do work on sexual health and uh, they have used that clause as a way to be able to interview um, young people about sexual behavior without uh, consent from their parents. And this may be a very important thing for us to be looking in when we, when we look at intergenerational conflict around uh, vaccine uptake. We have, at least in the States, we have an entire generation of parents who have an anti-vax position, and we have an entire generation of young people who do not. So that conflict may be on the horizon to think through. It may be different in your particular geography, but I know in the States it is an issue. I want to talk to you quickly about this notion of ethics of care. So ethics of care is, uh, began as sort of feminist literature and it sort of moved uh, beyond there. There are five ways to think about ethics of care. There's the notion of caring about someone or something. There's the notion of caring for someone or something. So taking responsibility to meet a need. There's a notion of caregiving that is the actual physical work of doing it. There is the idea of care receiving, that is figuring out are, are people, you might be giving care, but are they receiving it that way? And then the idea of caring with, right? So I've spoken with regard to kids, uh, if they perceive you talking at them rather than talking with them, the conversation sorts of somewhat stops. And of course, the same thing can be said 
with um, anybody who feels at risk. If the feeling is that you're not in it together in some way, a lot of the effort doesn't go as planned. So figuring out the, the protocols and the limits and the responsibilities in these situations is of course up to every individual and every organization. Look, some days we don't have the emotional bandwidth for a lot. I go through this as a teacher quite a bit, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not a question that we shouldn't be talking about. This is a link to Mental Health First Aid, First Aid International who do trainings. And um, they also, because of COVID, a lot of the stuff is online, which is uh, quite handy, actually. Uh, this last bit I want to share with you has to do with engagement. So it is this section on the left, the respect part of our diamond. When you engage with somebody, the first rule is respect. So uh, we saw this earlier, these ideas of identifications and beliefs and values and power dynamics. And now I wanna drill into those just a little bit. So this is one of those huge charts that, you know, it looks like you can find your astrological love on it, but it, it starts in the middle with personality and then it moves out to the different kinds of dimensions that make up humans. And when you're speaking with people, when you're interacting with them, understanding that that's how they're coming at and through misinformation, it, it matters. So uh, that would be the sort of the first stop of respect, understanding that everybody, including ourselves, we're intersectional. We live in a lot of different kinds of bodies at a lot of different kinds of moments. This is something I drew up a while ago because I kept getting all this material that were, people would ask, well, press would say, so do you think social media is empowering or disempowering? And I'd be like, what? The, yes. The answer is yes. And so I made this chart in the middle. You can see the idea of the, our, our identity, our sense of identity while we're using social media. And I've divided it into the social side on the left and the mediated side on the right. And you can see on the social side, we have all of those markers like age and disability and you know how we're treated institutionally by schools or polices, right? Um, social discourses about what's appropriate emotionally, what's a healthy body size, who's being a drama queen, et cetera, et cetera. Those would be on the left-hand side. Then on the right-hand side, you have all the things that structure our interactions online. You have things like state control, that could be censorship or surveillance. I'm start starting at the top of the circle on the right-hand side. You've got institutional control. You've got corporate control. What can you do on a platform, right? If you're on, um, if you're on Facebook, you, uh, and you show your breast in the middle of a, you know, a mother's group uh, for a, a, a breastfeeding exercise, that can be removed for terms of service. So uh, you, have, you have all of these things coming at you, some ostensibly for your own good. I had an experience where I was sharing with folks how I was managing my depression and tools I was using to cope. And then I had a bad day and Facebook blocked me and sent me a swipe message that I had to swipe to find help before they would let me back into the service. For me, that was incredibly shaming. I'm sure for them, that was an effective way to deal with a potential risk. So uh, you have our, our identity is, is between these, these polarities, right? The social and the media. And our next speaker is going to be talking about inclusion. So I will not be spending time on that. And then here is a recap of our terms. And then here is a recap of our steps. And then here's me saying thanks for watching. And then uh, this, as I said, is um, a link that you are welcome to that has the PDF of these slides, a bit of a bibliography I made for folks. Uh, 
PDFs that I had stolen and um, sorry, and uh, some other links. It, the, the, the file is a little sloppy right now, but I promise it'll be in nicer shape by tomorrow. So um, thank you, unicorns. And sorry, I went super fast in New York style. The end. <laughs>